Hi everyone, welcome to Mahu Church Online today. And today we're beginning our Advent series leading up to Christmas, which you probably realise is not too far away now. Uh, today is also the start of our Walk to Bethlehem Challenge. And if you haven't already, maybe it's a good time to, to join us, to put on your walking shoes and, and uh, meet us on our Facebook page, Mahu Walk to Bethlehem. Uh, Chewie and I have already been planning our walking paths, so we're ready to go. Now, you may also have noticed that the background that we've got today looks a little bit different this week. Uh, last week, the, our team were busy painting our media studio, and now we have two sets for you. Uh, the, the one we have here is the adult set, and on the other side of the camera, we've got our children's um, kids, Mahu Kids program, uh, which you'll be seeing next week. So thank you for Alicia, Aidan, and Rebecca for setting that up. And next week, we're planning to start our kids program. And you'll be most welcome to join us on that as well, even if you are a grown-up. And you'll be able to find this on our same Mahu Church YouTube channel. And if you've got children at home, you should be receiving an activity pack this week. Now, as it is Advent, it's probably a good uh, time to start with a carol. So we're going to listen to God Rest Ye Merry Gentlemen from the team at Church of the Highlands. Um, but before we do that, let's pray. Father, in a season like this, it's so easy to be distracted with all the stresses of the world going on at the moment. It's so easy to be overridden by fear or frustration, but Lord, your word says that your perfect love casts out fear. So Lord, right now we invite you into our households and into our lives again, as we remember the significance of this season, that you so loved the world that you gave your only son, Jesus, to show your love for us. So we welcome you now. We welcome Jesus, the Prince of Peace, into our lives right now at this moment, that your glory would be known through the way we live out of our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another if any of you has a grievance against someone. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. 
by my calculations, this is about the 11th time I've taken a Christmas service at this church. And, and it can always be a bit challenging trying to come up with something a bit original for this Advent season leading up to Christmas. Because, I mean, the Christmas story, well, it doesn't really change that much. I mean, you've always got Mary and Joseph, you've got baby Jesus, you've got the shepherds, and uh, the angels out in the field, evil King Herod and, and the wise men. Uh, but one word that popped into my mind as I started reflecting on this subject, particularly with regards to the wise men, was this word quest. Now, now quest is a word that we don't usually use that much anymore. In fact, it's a bit of a word that was more common a long time ago. Knights in medieval times went on quests. And a quest was a, a word used to describe a long journey, but a journey with a difference. Because it was a journey that had a point to it. A quest wasn't like an extended Sunday drive. When you quested, you were going somewhere to do something. Quests had goals. For example, if you've ever seen the movie Indiana Jones and the Lost Crusade, this is a movie about a quest. The hero, Indiana Jones, trips all over Europe and the Middle East because he was in search of something of incredible importance. He was looking for the legendary Holy Grail, the cup that Jesus drank from before his crucifixion. He, he wasn't going on an extended holiday around Europe, he was going on a quest. He was going somewhere to do something, to find the Holy Grail and to bring it back. And we see this idea of quest but also being played out in the Nativity story. The account of the wise men, or the Magi, as they're also called, is found in Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 to 11. And it goes like this. After the time that Jesus was born in Bethlehem, in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born a king of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose, and we have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed, and all Jerusalem with him. He called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, and he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. In Bethlehem, in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means the least amongst the rulers of Judah, for out of you will become a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me, so that I too may go and worship him. I think there was a little bit of a fib going on there. Then after they had heard the king, they went on their way. And the star that they'd seen, when it rose, it went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. And so when they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. And then they opened the treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Now who were the Magi? They were most likely advisors to foreign rulers from countries like Babylon and Persia and beyond, possibly even as far as India. And the word Magi, it can be translated as princes, but it was generally understood to mean court officials. Similar to what Daniel was to King Nebuchadnezzar many centuries earlier in the Bible. And just like Daniel, these were guys who were responsible for understanding the signs and the wonders of the times and interpreting them for the kings that they served. Which explains why something like a bright star in the sky would have given them cause to pack up their things and to find out what this was all about. Because it was their business to know what the signs likely meant. It was not probably not unlikely either that they would have had a few copies of the ancient Hebrew um, prophecies as well, like the book of Daniel, which predicted there was going to be an all-powerful Jew Jewish ruler emerging around this time. So for these reasons, it would have been enough to send them off on this quest to find this mysterious ruler. And this quest led them across the deserts for at least 1,200 kilometers, which is the distance between Babylon and Jerusalem, the capital of Israel. And when they arrived, they met King Herod and his advisors, the priests and the teachers of the law, and these guys pointed them off in the direction of Bethlehem, where they found the king that they were searching for, sleeping peacefully in a manger. They'd reached their goal. 
But what were they supposed to do after that? If you think about it, it would have been a pretty weird idea to have gone all this way without some kind of plan as to what to do next. And of course, the Bible tells us that yes, they were prepared. They bought gifts for this promised king. Gifts of gold and frankincense and, and myrrh. And the question many people have asked throughout the ages is, why these three specific gifts? They're, they're weird presents to give a newborn baby. I mean, what's, ba what's a baby supposed to do with a slab of gold? Gold's a pretty heavy metal. A, a golden rattle could probably be a fairly dangerous weapon in the, in the hands of a little baby. I guess you could say that frankincense could be used as perfume, which I guess could be useful, especially when you were changing the nappies. But myrrh, myrrh was what they used as embalming fluid back in the day, which begs the question, what on earth were they thinking? Even as a practical joke, giving a baby embalming fluid seems a little off. But what theologians throughout the ages have pointed out was that these gifts uh, were things that had prophetic symbolism for Jesus. Gold was the ultimate gift for a king. A frankincense, a heavenly aroma that changes the atmosphere. And myrrh, myrrh was pointing towards Jesus' eventual death on the cross. His crowning moment as he faced down the sin of the world. So these were gifts of prophetic significance for Jesus. But actually, I'd like to take that a step further. I would suggest to you that these gifts, they don't simply speak about Jesus and who he is. I would also I like to argue that these gifts, gold, frankincense, myrrh, these things are symbolic of the call that Jesus has on our lives and the ministry that God has made us for. If you like, they symbolize the way in which we can present ourselves as gifts of God today, here and now. And so for the next three weeks, as we work our way along the Advent calendar, we're going to explore each of these gifts and ask the question, how do these gifts speak prophetically to me and the way God is calling me to live my life? And the way, uh, the gift I wanted to briefly talk about today is the gift of gold. So what is gold representative of? Well, in the ancient world, gold represented the highest value. It was a kingly gift, and it still is today. Uh, while there are probably more valuable metals than gold around, um, gold is still recognised as representing the highest of all values. People still talk about the, the gold standard as being the best there is. In the Olympics, you see people compete for the gold medal. You don't see anyone competing for the platinum medal. And I tell you what, there'll be no one running for the uranium medal, even though technically these, both of these medals are worth more. But gold represents something of the highest value. And so when it comes to God and his kingdom, what is the thing that you think is of the greatest value? What could it be that we possibly could offer God that could match a gold standard? Well, what about love? In 1 Corinthians 13, the Bible speaks about the primacy of love compared to anything else that we could possibly offer God. 1 Corinthians 13 reads like this. It says, what if I could speak the languages of humans and of angels? If I did not love others, then I would be nothing more than a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. What if I could prophesy and understand all the secrets and all knowledge? And what if I had faith that moved mountains? I would be nothing unless I loved others. But what if I gave away all I owned and let myself be burned alive? I would gain nothing unless I loved others. Love is kind and patient, never jealous, boastful, proud or rude. Love isn't selfish or quick-tempered. It doesn't keep a record of wrongs that others do. Love rejoices in the truth, but not in evil. Love is always supportive, loyal, hopeful, trusting. Love never fails. Now what the author of Corinthians is trying to get across to us is that love is the thing of primary value in the kingdom of God. Love is the gold standard. Interestingly, this chapter is written in the midst of a section in Corinthians talking about different gifts and abilities God has given to the people in his church. Gifts of healing and miracles. 
and prophetic words, and these are all things that are pretty extraordinary in terms of gifts. But in this passage, he goes on to say that these things are temporary. They'll pass away. But love, love will remain. Love is the gold standard. And so if love is so important to God, what does that mean for us when it comes to how we follow Jesus? As Christians, I don't think there's a question that is more important than this. Because love is something that lasts the distance. I remember my nana always used to say to me, Nick, always buy quality. And what she meant by that was, if you are going to invest in something, make sure that it will be something that will last. Don't waste your time on stuff that will not last the distance. And so with that in mind, if you're going to commit your life to following Jesus, maybe my nana's advice might work for you here. Because don't you think it would be a good idea to commit yourself to the things that matter to Jesus? You know, if you were to think about this logically, in the light of eternity, what should we be investing our life in? I mean, we can so easily get caught up in things that can seem to us really important in the time, and they can be good things. But in the light of eternity, they are never as important as love. I've seen people who have invested their lives studying theology, and they know their Bibles back to front. They know what they believe in and how to back that up. And I don't disagree with a lot of what they believe. But for some, if their actions don't mirror love, does it really matter? I've seen some people who commit themselves to great and noble causes. There are those who have built great businesses, those who have committed their lives to political leadership, or even serving in the church. And I can't fault their effort and their passion. And many have got great, amazing results to their names. Great churches, great reputations, great achievements. But if all these things are achieved at the expense of love, does it really matter? 1 Corinthians 13 is pretty clear when it comes to this point. When it comes to what God is wanting from us, love is what he's looking for. So if you haven't invested in love, if you haven't been building kindness and gentleness and humility and honesty and peacefulness and forgiveness in your life, then the accolades everyone else might bring you are worthless. Because God is looking for people who know how to love. Love is the gold that God is wanting to draw out of us. And if we don't allow home space to build this into us, then at the end of the time when we stand before God in his throne, it might be a little bit awkward. Because the question God will be asking will not be, how much have you achieved for me? You know, how did that building project go, Nick? Or how big is your church now? Is it the biggest in the town or the city or the country? No. The question God will have for us is how have you learned to love? How have you been guided by kindness and patience? How have you been shaped by humility and gentleness? How much is your life being shaped by Jesus? This is the gold that God is looking for. And so with that in mind, as we prepare ourselves for this Christmas season, let me leave you with this challenge. How are you wrapping yourself up for God this year? Does your life look like a life that is filled with love? For some of you, perhaps it might be an idea to reread those verses in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 again, especially verses 4 to 7, and ask yourself the question, hey, what are the areas in my life that might be worthwhile working on? Perhaps you might want to come before God and say, Lord, help me in this area, Lord. I'm struggling with my selfishness or my, or my temper or my ability, my trying to control people. If you're feeling really brave, you could ask someone, how am I going? But maybe that's a one-on-one -on -one question. Maybe not in your discussion groups. You, you might not always appreciate the answers you get straight away. But the question remains, how are you wrapping yourself up for God this year? Is love your golden standard? Well, as we close on that challenge, here is the good news. As much as you may be missing the mark when it comes to being a loving person, God loves you so much more. And he's fully invested in, in helping you become the, the fullness of the loving person that he's made you to be. Because God is love. And he made you in his image. 
And God is kind and patient. And God isn't selfish or quick-tempered. And God doesn't keep a record of wrongs like other people might do. God rejoices in the truth. He's always supportive. He's always loyal. He's always hopeful and he's always trusting. And God never fails. So, And he loves you. And, and, and that's enough. So on that note, let's, let's take some time to pray. Father, while the road uh, before us might seem to stretch out a long way between where we are and where it is you're calling us to be, Lord, we thank you that we can take comfort in the hope that we have that you are with us and that through you and through Jesus, we will become all you've made us to be. We thank you for the good news of the Christmas message, that you didn't leave us to our own devices, but you made a way for us to come to know you and your love for us by sending Jesus, that even at our worst, that we would see the fullness of your love for us. Lord, bless us continually by turning our hearts towards you. And may those around us know you by the way that we love. Amen. So as we close, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and your families, all those you love, and bring you peace. God bless everyone.